new industrial strategy and also that crucial Supreme Court ruling on Brexit coming up this week. First, the Sunday politics where you are. Hello and welcome to the Sunday Politics Wales. In today's programme, crossing the line, why the first Welsh tax for 800 years needs an urgent revamp. And we've heard from the PM, but what does the Welsh Conservative leader and leading Brexiteer Andrew Arty Davis make of the latest Brexit moves? He's here with me live. But first, tomorrow morning, Karen Jones and Leanne Wood are expected to announce their plans for Wales after Brexit. The two leaders, along with uh, the Welsh Lib Dems, have agreed a common platform. They'll, they'll call for continued participation in the single market, but also a fairer system of immigration. So how will all that play into the current situation? Well, two women who know all about the intricacies involved are the Labour AM and former MEP Leonard Morgan and Dr Joe Hunt, who's an expert in EU law at Cardiff University. Thank you both for, for coming in and joining me this morning. Um, Leonard Morgan, what do you know about what we can expect tomorrow morning, this, this joint platform between Carwin Jones and Leanne Wood? Well, I haven't seen a copy of the paper yet, but I do know that this issue of having the best possible access to the single market is top of the list, uh, that there's an understanding that on immigration, that, that there needs to be a, a different approach to immigration so that if people come here, then they need to be here with a job. Um, but there's also an understanding uh, that, that we need people uh, to be helping us with our services, with our health service and uh, social services in particular, and that we'll be in trouble if some of these people have to go home. Um, I guess everybody accepts they want the best access to the, to, the, to the single market. You know, there's that point that everyone apart from North Korea has access to the single market. But how do you think that balance needs to be struck between getting as much access as possible while at the same time doing something on immigration, because the two aren't necessarily, you know, uh, compatible, are they? If we get this access issue wrong, then it will impact jobs in this country massively. But it would not just impact jobs, it'll impact things like already we're seeing hemorrhaging of jobs from the City of London, and they provide 12% of the income of this country. Now, that's going to impact on jobs, not just on jobs, but on, on our services, on our hospitals, on our schools. And people need to understand that this is not just about jobs, it's about their services and it's about what's going to happen in Wales in future. It's, it's just a huge big gamble with the future of this country. Um, Joe Hunt, you, you're our expert. And on this programme, we still, we still <laughs> like experts on this programme. So, we, just wondering, with that, that point of the balance between single market membership mm -hmm. and freedom of, of uh, immigration, freedom to, to, to travel, how closely tied are those things? Because we'll hear politicians saying, well, maybe we can do something on freedom of movement, you know, and still have the full access, the full membership of the single market. Is that a possibility? <laughs> Well, the single market or the internal market, it's referred to in, in different ways, but it's the same thing. It's this idea that we have free movement of the factors of production. So goods, services, capital. And to start with, it was workers. And that's been sort of expanded out over the years. But when we look at the treaty, it tells us that the internal market comprises those four things. And so they are, as we've seen it so far, indivisible as far as we've experienced it so far. Now, the thing to recognise with these free movement provisions are none of them are absolute. That there are restrictions, there are limitations that are available on all of those things. And if we take the free movement of people, the free movement of workers, there is a, a piece of legislation, EU law, a citizenship directive, that makes it very clear that EU citizens, so those that have EU nationality, nationality of one of the member states, are thereby EU citizens, and they can take advantage of the free movement rights. But that doesn't mean that you can go and live in another member state without restrictions and then have full access to all the services in another member state. The Citizenship Directive makes it clear that you have a right to be in another member state for three months, but after that, as far as EU law is concerned, then you need to be either economically active, so a worker, or you can be a student, or you can be retired so there, but you have to have the resources to support yourself. Three months is something I bet most people watching at home will say, I never knew that was happening. Is, is it just not being implemented then? Yeah, and these, it falls to the different member states to implement those rules 
you know, according so you to their own provisions. So the, what we also have, and you know, we have a court of justice that interprets these provisions, and it has taken quite a robust interpretation of what these rights are, because your free movement rights are allied to this right of non-discrimination, that you get treated as though you were a citizen of the state that you are residing in. Now, when we talk about not being, the, the, the directive talks about not being a burden um, and so there could be, you know, you wouldn't be fulfilling the terms of the directive if you became a burden on the social service system of that member state. The court said not to be an unreasonable burden. So there's the space there to interpret what does that mean. Mm. Uh, but as I said, you know, EU law does provide for, for restrictions that perhaps haven't always been fully given effect to. But I, I guess the other side of that is maybe um, certainly many voters would have voted with a view of, of regaining control of borders. But the other side, I guess, is um, being freed of, of the rules of the single market, making it easy to, to trade internationally with, with countries outside the EU. Do, do you not have a, a, a note of optimism about the ability of the UK to, to strike up new deals there? I think the person who's got a, a note of optimism is, is Theresa May, but I must oh, say good. I think it's slightly naive as well to think that we can tear up a relationship that's been developed over 40 years. It's our biggest market by a long shot. It's what we have. It's a bird in the hand. And what we're doing is tearing up that relationship in the hope that we will be able to develop relationships with countries across the rest of the globe. And we know from Trump's speech yes, uh, this week that he's going to put America first. If we have a negotiation, no, negotiated trade agreement with him, it won't be about Britain's benefit. It'll be about the United States' benefit. I think it's very, very high risk. I think we're playing about with people's lives and livelihoods. It will impact on our schools and hospitals, and we need to wake up to the reality of what is going on in this country. Um, we, we know that tomorrow, Carwyn Jones and, and Leanne Wood will, will have this uh, plan for Brexit. What's the danger that Theresa May just ignores it completely? Well, uh, what I'm hoping is that in the uh, white paper we will see an evidence-based report which will show categorically the impact of uh, going towards World Trade Organization uh, agreements, for example, would have on this country. Not it the, will. But that's not necessarily what will happen. There are, no, there are but, other options. But let's not forget yeah, that, that that was the worst case scenario. Mm. And I think it's, uh, it's being rather presumptuous to think that all the other member states are just going to roll over and say, yes, we are going to give you agreements on all these different sectors of the economy. I, I think we need to wake up to the reality and make sure also we have a better relationship, a new relationship with the UK government, that constitutionally we are also on a different footing. Um, uh, Johan, I just want to um, touch on this element of there's, uh, there's a trade benefit for the EU to continue trading freely with the UK, but at the same time, those remaining countries of the EU are fighting for their political future of the European Union. How much of a, uh, of a conflict is there between those two elements within those remaining EU countries? Well, you know, we've seen that there's the, the economic case may be made that it would be in the EU's interest to continue having free movement, that we would still have open markets between the UK and the EU. But what's also clear, it's not simply about economics, that it is, you know, it's... There is a story and a history, there's a narrative about being part of the European Union that you know, the other member states have a different, a different engagement with it, a different understanding of what being part of the European is and what that brings and what that gives them. And, and so it's not simply going to be an economic decision that they take. Uh, is in, the, in the terms of that they're fighting for their future and therefore may be more punitive than is necessarily needed. I, th I think the, the language of, of being punitive, of, of damaging, I think, you know, there's, there's been clear that that's, that's not the position that, that they're taking. You know, it's this is the deal. You're not going to get a better deal than being part of mm. the EU. You know, the EU brings you those rights to, to trade freely, to, for your, your people to, to move, that there is no better deal on the table than that. Yeah. There we are. Sorry, we're, we're, we're out of time at the moment, but... We'll have the Brexit of tomorrow. We'll have High Court on uh, Supreme Court on Tuesday. Surely more opportunities for you to come. But for the moment, thank you very much, both of you.